Firstly, good morning. Thanks very much for the invitation and the quick introduction. I think it's very interesting to see what the coming talks will be about. I will talk about light scattering in particular, and then some tips and tricks on how you can use light scattering. So quickly, what is a nanoparticle? I think maybe everybody is familiar with that, but I just wanted to mention it again. What can you do to size nanoparticles? And then the, the core will be dynamic light scattering, which is also known as uh, photon correlation spectroscopy or quasi-elastic light scattering. So uh, I'll assume that many of you are using light scattering in some form or another, and I wanted to add some practical tips on what you can do with light scattering, what you should watch out for. So first part, what is a nanoparticle? Well, the generic definition is anything that ha has at least one dimension under 100 nanometers. And then there's a, a European specification in a way that, that says you have to have at least 50% by number. Just wanted to throw this out there because um, nanoparticles get thrown around a lot and people even call 300, 400 nanometer things nanoparticles, so I completely understand that, but just wanted to mention that. So how can you size things? There are a few techniques that many of you are familiar with. Uh, I, I bunched uh, AFM, SEM, and uh, transmission electron microscopy together here. They're kind of microscopy-based, number-based techniques where you take an image and somehow count how many particles you have of the different sizes. Then you can do small angle X-ray scattering where you use the, the advantage of having a low wavelength to probe dimensions on the nanoscale. And then there's a technique that's called nanoparticle tracking analysis that's been around for um, maybe the last 10 years. And then the, the one that I like best, um, coming from Melbourne, is dynamic light scattering, and I'm gonna focus the most on that one. Why is nano even important in nanomedicine? And, and I think uh, James alluded to that. Um, there are certain things, like the blood-brain barrier. You need to make things small enough to actually get into the brain if you want to solve or cure a disease uh, in the brain. Um, you maybe want to target specific uh, circulation times. Depending on how large the, the nanoparticles are, they spend more or less time in the bloodstream because they might get thrown out or eliminated or they get stuck somewhere. And then there's a neat effect, the EPR effect, uh, the enhanced permeability and retention effect, where you can actually use it to your advantage that some cancer cells actually leak a little bit and have larger pore sizes so you can deposit larger nanoparticles in there and maybe target indirectly your chemotherapeutic agent that otherwise would adversely affect all cells in your body to only the, the uh, oncologically affected ones. So biocompatibility is something you have to, to uh, keep in mind. Um, so the size scale on the bottom, very small things get um, eliminated through the kidneys, and then very large things, maybe you can use this EPR effect, but charge is also something, and I'll, I'll, I'll allude to that a little bit later in the talk. So zeta potential is something that says uh, what, what the outside surface charge of your particles is like. And it tends to be in, in nature, most things are negative. And when you have positive things, they tend to stick to, to uh, other cells or have sometimes not the desired effect. So maybe cytotoxicity or they get uh, recognized by the RES. So let's go to light scattering. What this image was here, let me see if I can do this again, let me see. One more time. Um, this is a, supposed to be a little particle, and it's uh, getting hit by, by electromagnetic magnetic radiation, by light, and the particle absorbs the photon and then the, and re-radiates it again in, in all directions. So it's temporarily absorbed and then goes out. We can use this in a setup by shining a laser into a, a sample that actually has nanoparticles in it, and you will actually see the laser beam in there just because of the fact that the particles are scattering light. You can follow these trajectories under a microscope, and that's called nanoparticle tracking analysis. So that's a way to, to actually, from getting this random walk, this, the, this red line that you see there on the screen in the upper right, you can follow that trajectory, the mean square displacement, and from that, determine one by one the diffusion coefficient of every particle, and then get a size distribution out of that. But what I would actually want to concentrate on here is not measuring them one by one, but looking at the ensemble of them. What you see here on the left is a little video of colloidal gold nanoparticles, and you see them moving very rapidly. On the right, you see a video of, of milk fat droplets, casein micelles. They're larger, and they move more slowly. So if we can somehow characterize this, 
small movement, fast diffusion, fast fluctuations, or large particles move more slowly, slower fluctuations, then we're in business, and that's what we do in dynamic light scattering. We shine a light into a sample and look at maybe 175 or 90 degrees, doesn't really matter. But the core is we're looking at the sample and then we look at these intensity fluctuations. So the red line that you see there are the intensity fluctuations. And we statistically analyze them by looking at the intensity, comparing it with itself. I always like to use this hand-waving argument, and I'll see if I can do this here without getting destroyed. We take a photo of the sample, and a short time later, we take another photo. And if you, the other one is right on top of it, there's a strong correlation. If you take the second photo much later, you don't get a good overlap anymore, and it slowly grays out. And so that gives you a characteristic time scale how fast things move away from their, from their position. And then um, the rest is just theory. Um, the exponential decay rate of, the, of that uh, movement is related to the diffusion coefficient. And then you can use the Stokes-Einstein equation to get the hydrodynamic size out of that. You just need the Boltzmann constant, the thermal energy, and then the viscosity. Um, if you pay a little close attention to the equation, there's actually a summation of different exponential decays because in real life, things are a little more complicated. If we have just one thing, one particle kind in the sample, you can measure a correlation function that ideally has a nice intercept, meaning the, the y-axis is close to one. And that gives you an idea of the contrast between particle and background. And then the, where the, the function falls off, um, indicated by the blue arrow there, that gives you an idea of the time scale. And then you can also look at the slope. And this is a, a maybe somewhat uh, unusual, but linear y-axis logarithmic x-axis plot. So it looks a little bit like a sigmoidal curve. And then at very large times, you, you can uh, look at the, the baseline. That gives you an idea of whether there's really large things in there, very slow things. Okay. In real life, things are not that easy. You may actually see two or more or however many decays. And then just getting one average size out of it, like the z average in yellow there, is maybe not the perfect way to look at it, but instead you get a whole distribution. So maybe uh, something of, of 20 or 10 nanometers and, and 100 nanometers in this case. When we talk about distribution, something that's really difficult to understand for newcomers to light scattering is the idea that there are different ways of describing distribution. Let's do a little thought experiment. We have 50% of 5 nanometers and 50% of 50 nanometer particles here. So if you do number distributions, you see these two nice even peaks. 50-50, but people tend to think in terms of concentration. How much do I have, actually, instead of counting them? So we can do that. Now, the, the concentration is proportional to the volume, so it's proportional to size to the third power. Now, all of a sudden, you have a thousand, much as, a thousand times as much material from the bigger things than from the small things. And now I'm going to make this even one more step more complicated and I'm going to look at scattering intensity. The scattering intensity is proportional to size to the sixth power. And now, all of a sudden, our 50-50 in number has turned into a 1 million to 1 in light scattering. The tricky thing is when we do light scattering, we start out with the red one and then go to the green one if we really wanted to. So the safest approach, if you don't take anything home from this, safest approach is to always stick with the intensity if you're doing dynamic light scattering, because that's the native way of doing this. OK. So there are some assumptions to go over to the other ones. What do we get out when we do light scattering? Well, one thing we get out if we do the easiest fit is we get a mean size out. There's an ISO standard that describes how you can do that. Very easy, one average cumulant size, or Z average. We can also get a polydispersity index, or PDI, and that gives you an idea of how non-homogeneous, how non-monodispersed your sample is. And then I alluded to that, you can also get a distribution, but to do that, it's actually a, um, a mathematically ill-posed problem, so there's a bunch of solutions that can solve that problem, but you can do non-negative least squares. And keep in mind that if you have things that are really close together, you won't see two peaks that come out. Say if the size is one to two, you won't actually separate that into two peaks. You need at least the three to one ratio. What's the nice thing about light scattering? Very little volume, wide range of uh, conditions that you can test, very sensitive, and it's just very fast. Uh, what's not so nice is Oh, it's positive, you don't need to tag, but what's not so nice is you can't actually specifically tag certain parts of your distribution. So if you put nanoparticles into a whole big serum mess with all other cell fragments in there, forget it. It won't help you. So there are a range of different applications that people have used this for, to use it for quality control, for looking at degradation, uh, looking at equilibria when particles uh, form fibrils or monomers. 
and then maybe change the pH or the temperature and maybe something expands or com contracts. So there's, there's really a ridiculously large number of, of publications out there using dynamic light scoring. Use it for a quick quality control, um, for qualitative comparisons. Use it for repeat measurements. Rely on Z-average PDI in most cases. Um, check the messages in a quality report. Yeah, look, pay attention to data, quality, um, and then a few don't use dirty cuvettes, overfilling low volume trust in, in number distributions is a little bit too dangerous sometimes, so don't overinterpret your results. One thing I'd like to briefly mention is you can also, while you're doing the measurement, apply an electric field, and then particles of opposite charge will move to the, um, in the electric field, so you can get the, what's called the zeta potential out of that by looking at the extra frequency shift, shift like a Doppler shift when a, a um, fire truck comes towards you or goes away from you. And let's look at some real liposome examples because I think that's what you all are here in this audience about, about uh, liposomes. So here we've prepared some anionic DPPG, DPPC. Um, liposomes in various ratios of, of DPPG, and I'll turn, just put, put it graphically, the red is the charge, and you see as you put more, the relative proportion of DPPG increases, you actually have more negative charge on there, while the overall size in green is relatively constant. There's, there's certain variations, and this was prepared by ultrasonic patients, so maybe it, it's influenced a little bit by the duration of what you're doing with it. You can also do cationic liposomes, so uh, again, various ratios of, of the surfactants, and what you then, then see is that the zeta potential, this time in blue, um, depending on the more DDAB you add to it, the um, more positive your charge gets, while the size stays relatively constant in this case. So, but what you want to do is you actually uh, want to interact these liposomes with maybe some plasmids. So what happens is if you have cationic liposomes and, and negative um, plasmids, they'll stick together and they'll form a complex. So when you mix them, you can actually look at, in blue here, the zeta potential, and you see that the charge goes from negative to positive as you increase the ratio, as you put more plasmids on there. You also see that the size peaks at the point where you have zero charge because then you actually have some aggregation. What you really want to do, though, is want to get these things inside the liposome, and for that one, you might have to use a condensing agent to make it neutral so that they form little clumps, and then you can encapsulate them. And so you can find, with light scattering or zeta potential, you can find the optimal ratio, how, you, how much polylysine, in this case, you would have to add to it to make them uh, form the core for your encapsulation. And then the other thing, you can functionalize the surface of your liposomes, and that will also change the... Uh, zeta potential and the stability of your, your particles again. Um, I wanted to give you a few quick trips, uh, uh, tips and tricks here. Um, you'd be surprised how many people have done something similar to what you are trying to do, so use Google to your advantage. Uh, if you put a zeta size in there, um, but other systems might work as well. You can actually find a lot of application notes on our website. Um, it's a little bit hidden, but there's a thing called a resource center on there. Um, then we have a blog where we try to write useful things, materials-talks.com. Um, sometimes it's easier to just use Google to get there. But so for example, for refractive index, a very popular question that we get, what's the refractive index of liposomes? Well, the intensity information is always correct. So you don't need to worry about refractive index if you don't uh, um, want to go to a number of volume distributions. But just to, to keep you at ease, it's 1.45, kind of a good, good average for your refractive index. Um, you can install the software on as many computers as you like. Don't worry about licenses, so download it from our website. We do have some e-learning, um, and there's a free one-hour tutorial on our, uh, I think it's actually on the blog, but if you have new users using the system, go for it. Tell them about it. Um, there is a manual. Surprisingly, not many people read the hard copy, but there's a PDF version. And what I like about PDFs is that you can press Control F and then search for what you're trying to find in your manual. Um, you can customize the software to put workspaces in there to make your own liposome um, or nano assembler workspace. And that's something that not many people know. You can use SOP players to concatenate different SOPs so you can make more complicated setups, maybe combine zeta potential and size measurements. And then one thing that not many people do but is a nice thing to keep a log of what your system is doing as a function of, of time. It's a little standard, but you can also use Toyin or your own internal reference. 
every once in a while keep track of what your system is doing. So in summary, I think, particularly about dynamic light scattering, it's a non-invasive technique to measure the size of nanoparticles, liposomes, molecules, and solution. High sensitivity, low sample volume need. Um, you get out the mean size and the polydispersity, and in many cases, even the size distribution. While we do have maybe limited resolution, but we have very good statistics, and when you apply an electric field extra, you can get extra information about the charge of your particles. So there's a few more things here, but I think that's the talk. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes, um, thank you very much for this nice presentation on DLS. I have a question. Um, Referring to a problem we have in, in nanoparticle development, what we measure with DLS, which is usually a set average and or in a polydispersity index is not sufficient. We need much more detailed and absolute information on the real size distribution profiles, which you showed that you can get it with uh, your NLS algorithm, but this is qualitative. In your company, are there any efforts to develop further technologies to get really quantitative insight in size distribution profiles? Because I find it difficult to find instruments which are applicable on a daily manner. You can measure it, but then it takes time. It's, it's a research uh, approach then. But it would be very good to have some instruments similar to your uh, classical instruments, uh, which enable real investigation of size distribution profiles on, on, on a regular basis with uh, reproducible output. Anything on yes, your company? Yes, so I, I, I did put that in there and I skipped over that. The nanoparticle tracking analysis actually allows you to do the distribution one by one. I, I, I like the instrument, but I think this is not really suitable. Okay. Um, then. <laughs> The, there are developments to try to improve the algorithm, but so far, I mean, the, the, the big downfall is that you have an ill-posed problem. You're trying to get a whole distribution out there. If you can make perfect, perfect particles without any aggregates, and they're all exactly the same, if you have some idealized solutions, then maybe there's a way to, no, to no, see No, I mean, something. for example, if you do it on, on a research basis, you could, for example, measure different angles and use then uh, combined algorithms to analyze that. This is what people in, in, in research doing. They, they spend much more time on that. And of course, we can do it, but I would be happy to have an instrument which enables me to do it without a dedicated scientist to run the instrument. Um, I th yeah, yes. Uh, let me just say that um, there are developments in, in the pipeline. And uh, um, the Zeta Sizer is one, one reason why it's been so popular is that because it's dead easy to use. And so um, a lot of people use it without really understanding much about light scattering. Yes, there is something coming, but at, as of this point right now, we don't have what you want yet. And one, another question here? Yeah, so we have our first online question oh, wow. from uh, Ibrahim, who's asking why DLS doesn't work uh, as precisely with some type of nanoparticles, and he's referring to 10 or 50 nanometer gold particles. So there should not be any optical interference, but why doesn't it work as well as, as expected? Um, so that's, that's a very kind of generic question. There are uh, some gold particles, if there's a very crystalline structure in the gold, you actually get an effect that's called rotational diffusion, and that can lead to an artificial peak at even lower size, and that might mess up your result. But really, it can be explained what's, what's happening there. And if you do have data, send them to our help desk, and we'll, we'll try whatever we can to, to make use and sense of them. Fantastic. All right.